Hey everybody, we are now on part three of the apartment drumming series, helping you be a better drummer by being able to practice more effectively no matter where you live and still be able to practice creatively and have fun with it. We've talked about the practice kit itself, we've talked about room acoustics, miking the pads, running it through processing and logic. So now we're ready to go a little further as far as the processing goes and see how close to a DIY electric drum set we can get this. So let's get going. So as I recorded this kit a lot, I realized I needed to make some changes to the cymbal sounds. The hi-hats were just a little too bright. They weren't quite sitting well in the mix. So I stuck a bunch of moon gels onto the hi-hat and realized, well, that still doesn't do anything for the actual initial attack. These have a very sharp transient when you hit them. So I have this old piece of denim, and so I stuck this piece of denim onto the edge of the top of the hi-hat, taped it on there. And so now suddenly it's got this really weird muffled trashy sound that's super cool and it's quieter. It's no longer piercing in the mix. It really sits well with the pads. I also really like stacking these cymbals. Cymbal stacks are really cool anyways because it's a really cool trashy sort of crash. So I decided to throw the 16 inch on top of the 18 inch here and see how that works. And also we've got some of our adjustments from last time. We've got that extra dampening on the underside of the drums, the paper towels on the resonant heads to deaden out the toms and the snare. I've got that same kind of dampening on the kick so we don't have any extra resonance. And the kick is turned around backwards for maximum punchiness so that the pad is making solid contact with the kick drum head. Okay, so you know what the kit looks like and you know what we're doing there. So let's just dig into logic for the rest of the video. Now we've added some distortion, some parallel compression, some more auxiliary sends to some other effects. So let's take a look at what we're doing. First, let's give a listen to the groove we've got going on, which is going to sound pretty big, fat, and crunchy with a lot of, <laughs> a lot of kind of distorted noise going on. You'll see why here in a second. So I really like this sound. It's kind of a Darren King vibe. So let's jump over to the mixer, see what we got going on. Same effects on each channel, same compression, same EQ as last time. None of that has changed. I added in some distortion on the kick just to help it speak better through small speakers and kind of fit with the, the sound that we're going for here, which it gives it more of a boomier kind of sound. Let's listen to the kick with and without the uh, distortion. First off with. Now we'll turn it off. And back on. Really like how that boominess helps contribute to the parallel compression and the bit crushing stuff that we've got going on. So I've got all of these signals sent over to bus four where we've got parallel compression going on and bus five where we've got bit crushing going on. What I like to do is send all of the signal over here and then start out with the fader down and gradually bring it up. So let's see what happens gradually bringing up into the bit crusher. For one thing, it starts off much quieter, which I've done to allow some headroom for the parallel bit crushing. That really adds the kind of lo-fi sound to it. It makes it sound very electronic and just really funky, which I think is cool. We can kind of do the same with the parallel compression, which also helps contribute to that big fat drum sound. Let's we'll start off with it all the way down. It really just makes the drums even bigger. It's definitely more subtle than the bit crushing, but still an important part of this drum sound. We've also got a couple additional sins here. Uh, we have the same short plate, medium verb, but I've also added a short delay, which I think is really cool for creating the sense that the drums are in a small but reverberant room and that they're right there in your face. It's one of those things that's hard to describe. Let's just listen to it uh, with the delay and then we'll take it away, see if you can hear the difference. And taking it away. And adding it back in.
It might actually be pretty subtle because I didn't add in a lot of it because if we pipe a lot of signal over to it, it does get really crazy. As far as what's going on here in the delay, nothing too crazy. It's really just a 20 millisecond difference between the left and the right. Just enough to add some stereo spread and make it feel like it's double tracked. Also over here in the bit crusher, we've got 10 bit resolution, a good bit of drive, um, which is, is definitely a lot of drive going on, but that's why I set it up uh, to be parallel processing. That way I can have this set to an extreme setting and still preserve the original signal over here and balance things out the way I like them. So that's about it for these effects that we've got going on. Next, let's take a look at what we can do if we add in samples completely altering the sound. So far we've been working with the sounds that we've got, but now we're gonna add in totally new sounds and see what we can do with that. Okay, so now I've added in these samples using the, uh, the drum doubling, drum replacement plugin in Logic, which I'll show you around here in a minute. Let's listen to what we've got. So you can hear now we've got more of an acoustic kick sound and you can actually hear the ring from a snare, which is kind of cool having that snare sample layered in. Adding in kick and snare samples is pretty easy and they usually sound pretty natural. Kick samples can be a little trickier as you can hear. I think Logic did a pretty good job of placing those Tom MIDI notes where they needed to be, but it's not perfect. Certain spots it sounds a little weird, and there may be a Tom note where there should just be a snare, or maybe there's not one where there needs to be one, because the big caveat with this is bleed. Especially on the Tom channels, it's very easy for a snare note to bleed into the Tom mics and even for hi-hat notes to bleed into a snare mic sometimes. A lot of times the kick is the easiest to isolate, especially in my situation here because I've got the kick mic over on the opposite side so it's not picking up a whole lot of any of the other drums. The snare is loud enough that it does fine and it's pretty easy to isolate. The snare notes, as you can see here, those are very distinct and you can tell the other notes, like kick notes down in there, they're super quiet. So it's very easy to get Logic to recognize only the, the snare notes here. And really the same is true for the kick. Those kick notes are very distinctly standing out there, so it's easy to recognize those and add in samples. Let's examine that more closely, and we'll kind of pull up an example here of, let's say we wanted to double this drum track, which would be crazy because this is an overhead track. We're just doing this for an example. We go up here to track, replace or double drum, drum track, which is also control D. It takes a second to analyze especially when it's a really wacky one like an overhead track where there's a whole bunch of transients and so it doesn't know what needs to be replaced or not. Let's say we're doing a kick sound, so we select acoustic kicks. We could also add in electronic kicks or other different layered kicks. We can click pre-listen and put the uh, playhead wherever and we can hear what it's sounding like. And we can use the relative threshold to basically tell Logic what transients need to be replaced. Watch what happens here on the MIDI track as I move this around. The lower we make that threshold, the more transients get replaced with MIDI notes or have MIDI notes added to them. And that's because as we go lower here, that's telling Logic that even some quiet transients in the waveform need to be replaced. So in this case, really, if we go really low, then every note played is going to get replaced because this is an overhead track. But you can play around with this, and generally if it's a snare track, you can keep this up pretty high, and it's only going to replace those really loud, punchy notes, like the sound of a snare. A lot of times on toms, we have to go a little bit lower, but we don't want to go too low because then we start to get bleed. And so that can be really tricky, and it depends a lot on what sound you're working with, what dynamics you're playing. Usually kick and snare are pretty easy, though, because you can float it right up here and get those replaced pretty accurately. So after you find that sweet spot and it looks like you've got everything, hit OK. And then you can go down and manipulate it further. If there are too many extra notes, you can go in and delete them. It's easier to have Logic throw too many notes into the MIDI track than not enough. If there's too many, you can just go in and delete stuff. If there's not enough, then you end up having to redo it. Okay, so I think we've done enough damage there. You get the idea. It's really interesting what you can do with this. 
And if you were to close mic the hi-hat, close mic the cymbal, then you could also replace those sounds as well and go even further with this, eventually eliminating the acoustic drum sound and just having these samples added in. At that point, you've got a purely MIDI drum track. So you could actually use this for basic drum programming. If you wanted to program beats, you could do that on a practice kit that you've got mic'd up, letting the audio going into those mics kind of be like triggered audio. The mics are functioning as triggers and we have those transients creating MIDI notes here in Logic. It's not a perfect system, but it may be the best one if you don't actually have triggers or you don't have an electric drum set. I think for me, it's just a fun way to experiment and see what all I can do with this kit, which I really like doing. Let's give it a listen again and see if there's any other adjustments we can make, maybe to make it sound better. So there's still that kind of fuzzy sound going on from the bit crusher. I think at this point, maybe that's not really necessary. Maybe we pull back the bit crushing. When we do that, that pulled back the acoustic signal so much, we hear a lot more of the MIDI kick and the MIDI snare. Something else we can do is send some of these drum samples into the same processors as we have the rest of the drums. That way it all is a little more cohesive. We've got all the acoustic drums going into all of these. We've got the compression, the bit crushing, which we've now turned off, and the delay and the reverbs. But we could also do the same for the samples, which would really make things sound a little more like they're in the same room. I'm not gonna do any bit crushing, but we'll kind of just mirror what we've got going on over here on the acoustic drums. A little bit of that, a little bit of that, a little bit of that, and then we'll send a lot of it over to the parallel compression. Let's see what this sounds like. Interesting. It kind of sounds like it's in a much bigger room now. I think I'd rather there not be so much of the medium verbs. So let's turn bus two all the way down. Yeah, that's a little better. I don't really like having the kick going over to the effects so much, so I might actually pull those back. Honestly, I think I'd replace that kick sample too. I'm not a huge fan of it now. It's a little too punchy for this. I'd rather have something a bit boomier. Yeah, right there you can hear how imperfect the toms are. You can spend a lot of time meticulously editing and getting those right. Really, the system works better just for kick and snare. So I hope that gives you guys some creative ideas here as far as what you can do digitally after recording basic audio samples. You could even create a drum set out of pieces of cardboard or like a tabletop or anything. And if you have different areas that you're hitting mic'd up, you could even use the sounds of hitting a tabletop with your hands to trigger these samples in Logic. So you could program basic drum tracks that way with any kind of acoustic sound starting out. So that's something that's kind of interesting and creative that you can definitely play around with where it doesn't matter what kind of audio quality you're getting with your microphones if you're bringing it into Logic and then totally replacing it with other samples. That can be a little bit more of a musical way to create a drum track than just hammering it out on a keyboard with your fingers or with the Command K thing here in Logic. So I hope these ideas have helped you out and have maybe gotten you thinking creatively in that direction towards making cool sounds with your practice kit so that you can stay inspired practicing and not lose motivation and be able to continue playing the drums even if you're not in an ideal drumming environment. Thanks everybody so much for watching. If this video did help you out, I'd love to have you subscribe. This channel is all about helping give you drum tips, drum ideas, drum lessons. My goal is to become a better drummer every day. And I learn things all the time, playing gigs and teaching students. And so I wanna share those things with you guys and help you also to become a better drummer and a better musician every time you sit down at the drums. Thanks so much for watching and I will see you on the next video.